Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Thursday, August 18th, 2022. We're going to be talking a lot about the Chinese Navy and what China's up to in the Western Pacific today. This episode is brought to you by Raytheon Missiles and Defense. The SPY-6 family of radars is not just revolutionary, it's ready now. SPY-6 is being integrated on ships across the fleet to provide greater range, increased sensitivity, and more accurate discrimination for air and missile defense. Learn more at rtx.com forward slash SPY-6. Just a reminder that the Marine Corps essay contest deadline is coming up on 31 August. Top prize is $5,000. Our fiction contest, co-sponsored with SimSec, has a top prize of $500 and a deadline of mid-September. And our annual photo contest is open now, as is the general prize essay contest, which has a top prize of $6,000 and a deadline of 31 October. Now let's get to our guest, retired Navy Captain Jim Fennell, who is joining us today from Switzerland. Jim was a Naval Intelligence Officer, who uh, spent much of his career in the Pacific. He served as the N2 or Director of Intelligence for CTF-70, the USS Kitty Hawk Strike Group based in Japan. He was the Senior Intelligence Officer for China at the Office of Naval Intelligence, then the Chief of Intelligence for the 7th Fleet, and finally the Director of Intelligence and Information Warfare at the US Pacific Fleet. Since his retirement in late 2015, Jim has written and spoken extensively on China and he is currently a fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy in Geneva, Switzerland. He's also written numerous articles for proceedings about the Chinese PLA Navy. Jim, welcome to the show. Bill, uh, it's great to see you, and it's great to be on this podcast. Thank you. All right. I would be remiss for our listeners if, it, if I did not say that you started sounding the alarm about China and the Chinese Navy at least five years before anyone else. And that was about 15 years ago. And you were 100% right about the trends and the direction where China was headed. Uh, I wanted to point out that in late July, Jim and I had the pleasure of doing a combined presentation at the Cambridge Security Initiative Conference at Cambridge University in England. Jim talked about the Chinese Navy and I talked about the Naval Institute's American Sea Power Project and trends in the US Navy. Jim's presentation on the PLA Navy was so well done and entirely based on unclassified sources that I thought we have to get him on the podcast to give this presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim now to give that presentation, and then we'll take some audience questions at the end. Well, thanks a lot, Bill. And uh, I'm going to try to get through these slides rapidly as I can so we can have that question and answer. Um, I believe uh, the evidence will show that China is uh, on a on a quest to restore themselves uh, to great power status, and they're they've actually achieved the levels of that give them a ability to do that. And largely, it's been based upon maritime power. Um, this slide here, I didn't include obviously uh, in our presentations in Cambridge because it hadn't happened yet. Uh, but what you see there is a, a picture uh, of the sh uh, ballistic missile shots from mainland China. Uh, against uh, Taiwan, and you'll see six closure areas that bracket Taiwan uh, from the east, the north, the south, and the west in, in the Taiwan Strait. And uh, depending on who you listen to, Taiwan Ministry of Defense says there was 11 missile shot. Japanese Ministry of Defense says there was nine missile shot. But regardless, uh, nine to 11 ballistic missiles were fired into these closure areas. Four, up to four of them went across uh, Taiwan, flew over Taiwan, uh, which is uh, really hard to, uh, you know, think about in terms of the relationship that China and Taiwan have had and the understanding that the United States government has had about, you know, kind of keeping a status quo and seeking peaceful resolutions. Uh, so I, I just show this slide to kind of get across that this is really a demonstration of the, the, the briefing that I gave in, uh, in Cambridge and I've been giving for the last uh, seven years since I've been retired, uh, to say that this is the path that China's headed on. And the next slide here is a, is a slide from 2012. And this is taken by an Australian naval officer on board a Chinese frigate, PLA Navy frigate, that was in Sydney Harbor in June of 2012. And this uh, frigate from the PLA Navy had been had come from the Gulf of Aden, where it had been part of one of the 
anti-piracy or naval escort task forces that China has been sending out there since December of 2008. They're now on their 41st task force. But this ship had come from China, transited all the way out to the Gulf of Aden, had done three, three and a half months on patrol, and then went down to Sydney with other ships of their task force and had a port call. And an astute uh, Royal Navy, Royal Australian Navy officer took this picture. And what you see is mainland China with a dragon's head coming out from the mainland of China with these three arrows or vectors uh, that are coming out, one into the South China Sea, one into the Sea of Japan, up into the Arctic, and then another one down, you know, north of Taiwan, but essentially down into the South Pacific. And I, I put that out there because in today's uh, a lot of people follow what's going on in China, and there's a, a school of thought that says that Xi Jinping's the real problem, the current uh, general secretary of the of the Chinese Communist Party, and that if we had you know somebody different in charge, things may not be so bad. Uh, but it's really important to see that this is a picture from June of 2012, before Xi was uh, put into power at the uh, Communist Party uh, plenum that occurred in October of 2012. And you have to realize that that picture was taken and pr produced and then posted on the bulkhead of a PLA Navy frigate, probably starting as back as for early as 2010. So what I, my point of showing this slide is to say that China is uh, the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party since Mao Zedong have all been marching towards uh, a, a, an end state. And Xi has called, told us what the end state is. It's called the Great Rejuvenation of China. But it's based upon this kind of dynastic thinking in China that's called Tin Sha or all under heaven, that the world, uh, everything that happens on the earth, uh, it comes through China and connects with heaven. And, and that's kind of where the mindset is of the Chinese Communist Party, not so much in Buddhist terms or that kind of uh, terminology, but uh, this idea that they need to be restored to their rightful place in history as the leaders of, and the arbiters of everything that happens on the globe. That's what they are, want to have, and that's what they're marching towards. And this picture really is emblematic of that. And to get to that uh, achievement of that great uh, rejuvenation and great restoration of territory, uh, it's based upon maritime power. And so there you have, uh, I think this is a picture from 2019, where you have over 45 PLA Navy warships, aircraft carriers, supply ships, uh, big deck amphibs, their latest uh, you know, destroyers and whatnot, and, and, and nuclear submarines, and the Jin class SSBN were all out in display in the South China Sea. And it was one of the biggest demonstrations of naval power by any nation in the South China Sea since uh, probably the Vietnam War. Uh, and it was China that did it. And you can see there that quote at the bottom where Xi said in 2013, right after he'd taken power and publicly had been announced as the new leader of China, that he says that, uh, you know, we're going to depend upon the ocean to make ourselves a maritime power. And there's other quotes where he talks about it as a great nation, we have to be a maritime power. So he's the first kind of paramount leader. Uh, you know, you had Mao, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Zhang Ximin, Hu Jintao, and now Xi Jinping, the five paramount leaders of the People's Republic of China since 1 October uh, 1949. And he's really the first one that's actually been a, such a strong proponent of maritime power. And he's backed up these rhetoric with real actions. And one of the ways they back it up is through what they spend their money on. And what you see here is just up through uh, 2021 from the uh, Chinese uh, own website, Global Times, but it, it's reported in other places, but it's the amount of money that they spend on their defense and you can see that each year uh, it, it's gone up. And, uh, you know, people talk about how much money spent and they like to focus on the just the dollar amount. And everybody says, well, the United States spends more than China. Uh, but there's a lot of other variables that go into calculating what really matters. But the point of this slide is simply to say that China has increased uh, the spending on the PLA and made it a top priority. And I'll give just one example. In 2020, uh, each year they have a National People's Congress in March of each year and the, the state government and the party come together and they announce here's what our economic situation is and here's what we think our GDP will be for the year, gross domestic product, and they always talk about their military spending. 
And in 2020, for the first time in 28 years, the People's Republic of China and the Communist Party could not tell the world and the people of China what they thought their gross domestic product would be. They said, we don't know because of COVID. And they delayed their party Congress or People's Congress until May. And even by delaying it two months and curtailing it by a week, they still didn't have enough information and confidence to give a GDP estimate. But they were able to tell the, the assembly there, the thousands of people that come for this assembly and the world, the press, that they would grow their military by 6.6%. It's kind of strange. 2021, it was kind of similar. They said, we really can't give you an exact GDP, uh, but we think it'll be something around 6%. But we know we will spend 6.8% increase on our defense spending. And let, you know, the year before, I should have said 6.6% increase on the previous year. So each year, they've been able to say that we spend more each year on the PLA than we have in previous years. Now, the rate of that increase may differ, uh, but the point is they prioritize where their money goes, and it goes to the PLA. And we should recognize that, especially when we talk about things like foreign direct investment from funds like TSP that many of us on this podcast probably pay into. So what does that mean? Well, if you go back to 2000, basically the, the, the first year, uh, it, it's a good starting point. But in 2000, China's Navy and its military was very weak. Uh, it was what we would consider a, a brown water Navy. Uh, they never patrolled more than 20 or 30 miles off their coast. They had old platforms, uh, you know, that from some from the World War II era. Uh, they had old Soviet types of submarines, and they didn't have a large amount. They were mo mainly a, a land power, and their land power was the size of their military and the, the vast numbers of, of people that they had in the PLA, over 2 million, closer to 3 million. So... If you advance uh, 20 years, you can see that the Chinese, with that spending that has gone on during that what we call the military modernization period of, of two decades, they were able to not only acquire new fourth and fifth generation platforms, uh, but they were able to also operate, begin operating outside the first island chain into the Philippine Sea and then even into the Indian Ocean. And as we saw up until uh, the COVID uh, uh, virus impact. They were operating in the Mediterranean, conducting exercise with the Russians, operating in the Baltic in 2019. I happened to be uh, fortunate enough to trick my way onto a PLA Navy frigate in Kiel, Germany. And uh, what I saw there uh, really impressed me. I had been on Chinese ships throughout that 20-year period. And what I saw in Kiel, Germany in, in December or in the summer of 2019 or the fall of 2019, was a ship that looked like a U.S. Navy frigate that I would have seen when I joined the Navy in 1986. These were people that had been at sea for, you know, four or five months. Uh, the ship was in great shape. The sailors were motivated. Uh, they had not just ship's company. They had staff there like a Desron, uh, and they had their own, uh, you know, it, it, it was a well-functioning ship, and they seemed to be very organized and motivated to do what they were doing, and they were in Kiel, Germany. And so, uh, that's how far they've come in a 20-year period. And just now, you know, projecting out some where are they headed, this is a, a chart that just came out of a study from the Hudson Institute. Uh, and what you see there is normally we were talking about China inside that first island chain uh, from Japan, the Ryukus, and maybe out to the second island chain. But what we're starting to realize now is that China is approaching in, in in going to be approaching the third island chain, which is out to Hawaii. And given some of the combat capabilities that they have with their uh, their naval forces and their naval air forces, they're going to be able to reach uh, Hawaii. Uh, and, and maybe they already are in Hawaii, and we just don't have access to some of the classified information. Uh, but this is where they're headed. This is the strategic trend line. Uh, so how did they get there? How did they get such a big Navy? Well, one of the ways is they have a large number of uh, platform or uh, shipyards. And you can see in this chart here uh, that the PRC operates 19 major shipyards compared to seven for the United States. Um, at the end of World War II, I think we had over 22. Uh, and just one of their main shipyards, uh, Zhongnan Dao, which is the shipyard that you're seeing the a chart of, which is just outside of Shanghai, that one uh, facility is, is larger than all seven of ours. Uh, it's in terms of geographic space, it's uh, four times the size of Newport News. And this is just a picture of, of, 
a part of Zhangyun Dao in their shipyard there. And you can see the number of platforms that are that were under construction uh, at the time of this uh, chart. I think it was in the summer or fall of last year. Uh, but what's important to note also is the product of what's coming out. Uh, last year in 2021, as the chart says at the top, China con uh, commissioned 22 warships compared to three for us. Now, up until 2021, that average, the Chinese had been out producing it at a rate of four or five to one of ours every year for the previous decade. Uh, so they're producing a lot of warships and there's warships of consequence. Uh, and you can kind of get a, a sense here of when this really started to go into high production it was around the 2011, 2012 timeframe, which is interesting because this is when all the economists in the China hands community had said that China's uh, defense spending would go down commensurate with the their GDP for the first time dipping below that 10% annual increase mark. Uh, so that soft landing that that we used to hear about in the 2010, 2011 timeframe, China's economy started to cool off and their annual growth of their GDP was under 10% for the first time. And we were told that defense spending would go down. Uh, but in terms of product, the product that you can see actually went quite up uh, very far. And it wasn't just in numbers of platforms, it was also in tonnage. This chart talks about the tonnage. Uh, and, and basically around 2012, 2014, China started to match us in tonnage. And since 2015, they've outproduced the United States in tonnage of aircraft. And uh, that trend line doesn't seem to be uh, changing in my opinion. So I've given some assessments. Uh, these have been published in the Navy War College Review and, and, and other places. I updated my estimate for where I thought the PLA Navy would be at 2030. I had given an estimate in 2015. I updated it in 2019. And I think they'll have a combined uh, naval force of major combatants that you can see listed there and, uh, and submarines, ballistic missile submarines and nuclear submarines, uh, probably around 560 or so uh, vessels. And, and that's really important when we start talking about where we are as a Navy and where we're at. And, even if we have finer ships and finer sailors, uh, it, it becomes a numbers game. And they're producing platforms like this, like the Renhai class cruiser, the Type 055. Uh, they call it a destroyer, we call it a cruiser. 112 VLS tubes that can launch land attack cruise missiles, can launch anti-ship cruise missiles like the YJ-18, that's 300 kilometers, supersonic sea skimming, uh, wicked bad missile. Uh, and they also have uh, the HHQ-9 uh, surface-to-air missiles. So it's a, it's a shotgun, and they're using these platforms. Now they have six commissioned. There's two more that are, are building, or I think are in the process of sea trials. And these, these platforms are going to be escorting uh, vessels like this, like the Type 075 uh, Yuzo-class uh, uh, amphibious assault helicopter carrier. Uh, this is about a 50,000-ton uh, vessel. Uh, the Type 055 is around 12 to 13 uh, tons. Uh, and so these are going to start escorting. The, the Type 055 uh, cruisers will escort these and form the basis of the new uh, Marine Corps that uh, Xi Jinping ordered to be put into production, where they increase the number of Marines from 20,000 to 100,000. And they're going to have expeditionary strike groups. Uh, they've also acquired uh, their former chief of Navy, Admiral Wu Sheng Li, was very, very uh, prescient. He was the kind of the modern day father of their Navy, and many, many people think so, I do. And he was very cognizant of their one key deficient, uh, deficiency that they had beyond other major platforms, but it was in resupply. And so we, if you go back to when I was at, on Kitty Hawk and CTF-70, and you watch the Chinese try to re refuel a sovereign many uh, destroyer in the East China Sea. Uh, I think the first year they tried that was in, I don't know, 03 or 04. And I remember the first year they did it and they screwed up so bad. And they had the, the Russian, the, the sovereign many fuel was black oil based and diesel. And it just, they they screwed up the decoupling and there was you could just, they, they, they smeared the entire uh, sovereign remedy. Uh, it, it was, you could see it. And the Japanese took pictures of it and everybody was having a good laugh. And now 20 years later, they're out uh, doing underway repl replenishment like we do. And they've been practicing it for, you know, since 2008 with their Gulf of Aden deployments. And now they've built this new class of uh, comprehensive resupply ships. Uh, again, this is like another 40, 50,000 ton vessel 
uh, that's there resupplying two of their Type 055 cruisers. It's also resupplying their aircraft carriers. And their aircraft carriers have been very operational. Uh, we saw them here in August, uh, this exercise. Now, one of them did have a problem, the first one, CV-16 Liaoning. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, their, their uh, aircraft carriers did come out uh, and operate in, uh, this is, I think, from uh, the spring of this year, but they were also out a, a couple of times uh, at the end of last year. So they're, they're very operationally focused. And they're integrating their carriers, uh, even though they may not be as capable of ours, they're not. But they're they're operating like we do and thinking like we do about having carrier strike groups and expeditionary strike groups. And then here's a picture of the newest one. You've probably seen it, CV-18, Fujian. Uh, it's, again, uh, a, a, a conventionally powered carrier. But what it has, and this kind of shocked everybody, is that they, they say they have uh, three uh, uh, electromagnetic aircraft launch system uh, catapults. And so this is a very uh, stark reminder that China has been stealing our technology uh, and skip echelon in the development of their, uh, their forces. And I think it's worth pointing out, you know, the first two were based on the Kuznetsov class, Russian uh, class uh, carriers of about 40, 50,000 tons. This new uh, CV-18 Fujian, is 80,000 tons. And as I think Jerry Hendricks, retired Navy, Dr. Jerry Hendricks, uh, has said, you know, this is in the super carrier class uh, in terms of its size and its capabilities. Now, we have to see how they perform. Uh, but just from my perspective, I remember arriving at PAC Fleet in 2011 and 2012. I remember sitting with the commander of the Pacific Fleet at that time, Admiral Walsh, and we were talking and looking at things that I can't talk about. But we were very amazed at what the Chinese were doing with their first carrier. And in a space of a decade, they've produced, three, they've produced and fielded these three carriers and, and we're still you know, struggling with one. And uh, again, our carriers are better, no question. I serve a lot of time on carriers and we are still a superior force, but we have to recognize that China is growing by leaps and bounds and they've stolen our technology. They've stolen our TTPs, we're very transparent. So. You know, a lot of our lessons learned and things that we learned in the hard way, they're, they're going to learn the easier way. So what are they doing with this big Navy that they have? Well, obviously, in the last 10 years, they, they've been taking territory uh, without firing a shot, but using their Navy as kind of the premise for intimidation was what they call comprehensive national power, using the power of their economy, using the power of their wolf warrior diplomats, using the power of information warfare, and also using the presence of their military to shape the environment. They took Scarborough Shoal without firing a shot in 2012 through the use of maritime power, not with the PLA Navy predominantly, they used it with their Chinese Coast Guard, but they were able to acquire territory from a treaty ally of the United States without having to fire a shot. And since uh, 2012, since June 16, 2012, the PRCs had sovereign control over Scarborough Shoal. Uh, and so from that perspective, they've been very successful. Uh, a few months later, in the next year, 2013, they started building seven artificial islands in the South China Sea. Everybody, I think, is aware of these. Those are a picture of the seven from a while ago. You can see how they're kind of configured in two triangles. Inside the, the, the red triangle is the, 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 you know, kind of some of their intelligence collection uh, capabilities that they have on the smaller reefs. But on the outside in the yellow triangles, you'll see Fiery Cross, Subi, and Mischief Reef. And those are the reefs that are the most important uh, because they are the ones that have the, the 3,000 meter or 10,000 foot runways and enough pier space to put in a couple of aircraft carriers uh, each. And remember, uh, at the geostrategic level, you know, President Xi Jinping told uh, President Obama, we're not going to militarize those. And just this last year, uh, Admiral Aquilino at Indo Pacific Command has said, hey, they're fully militarized. So there was just a a thing we can talk about is the trustworthiness of what the Chinese tell us when they're not going to do something. They also told us in 2018, they told General Mattis, Xi Jinping told them, we won't give up one square inch of this territory. And there's just a, a kind of picture that uh, is worth putting in your head, which is Subi Reef. Uh, and it's basically the same size as Pearl Harbor. Uh, Fiery Cross and Mischief Reef are similarly sized to Pearl Harbor. Sometimes they're even as big as the, the Beltway in DC. But the point is, you don't hear a lot of people talk in the media or in our academic journals and whatnot about the fact that China built three Pearl Harbors, 
from 2012 to 2015 in the South China Sea, but they did. And now they basically have uh, a military overmatch down there. And they have a vision for how they're going to use those forces on those three main islands. What you see is, um, this is from a, a magazine from Oh, 2006, 2008, called Naval uh, Ship Magazine, uh, Naval uh, Naval Navy and Ship Magazine. It's a Chinese magazine, and what you see there at the top is uh, on the top right is the South China Sea chart with those three uh, reefs, Mischief, Firecroft, and Subi. On the left is kind of the range rings of the platforms that would be emanating from there, the weapon systems, the HQ-9, the YJ-62, and then fighters, J-11s or J-H-7s. And then on the lower half, you see kind of an artist uh, depiction of how they would use shore-based uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles, ship-based, uh, and, and, and to launch at a target and blow it up. And that target that you see burning there is a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier. So this is what they're telling their civilian uh, defense industry, this is what you're doing for the, the motherland. Uh, they're also, in addition to the naval forces they have, they have a strategic rocket force, and they're keen on uh, attacking naval forces wherever they're at. And one place they know they're at is in Yokosuka Navy Base. This is from 2013. And on the left is Yokosuka Navy Base, and that's one of our aircraft carriers. Uh, I believe then it was a George Washington. And on the right is out in the Gobi Desert, where the Chinese rocket force trains and you see a, a, a mirror image of Yokosuka Navy base and with targets, mock targets uh, that are the same size as ships that we have. And they're practicing to uh, destroy the, the seventh fleet in port in Japan. Uh, those images on the right were bulldozed by the Chinese right after this kind of 2013 timeframe. And we didn't see anything for quite a while until this year, uh, in 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 May timeframe here, we saw a whole bunch of new uh, mock-ups put out there, and you can see just one picture uh, out in western China, and you can see naval bases and carrier targets listed out in the desert, and the, they're back at this very robust training program. You may have seen this in the South China Morning Post. They actually have an aircraft carrier on a rail, and they're practicing shooting at a moving target. They actually shot a moving target uh, in. Uh, August of 2020, and you can see the closure area southeast of Hainan Island uh, and where there was a shot from Qingha up in the northwest uh, of China, and then right outside of Ningbo uh, in eastern China, they shot a DF-21D and a DF-26 uh, into that target uh, closure area, and by all accounts, they hit uh, a moving target. Now, this was the first time that any one of these anti-carrier ballistic missiles had actually been seen to actually, uh, you know, find a target at sea and hit it. And I think it was a signal from China to our Navy to say, we know you've been watching this. I watched the development of this missile system in 2006, 2008, when I was at the Office of Naval Intelligence. Uh, but there were always skeptics around saying, well, they've never hit a moving target. And I think China very uh, deftly sent us a signal saying, we can hit you. And so this is a kind of a confirmation of the worst fears that many of us had. And so that's why there's a lot of work inside the Navy to figure out how do we uh, deceive this missile system or be able to shoot it down. A uh, couple of last slides here. In addition to these territorial issues, China is also working with the Russians. This is just a chart from this last year in December when, uh, you know, 10 ships from the Chinese Navy and the Russian Navy operated and circumnavigated uh, Honshu, uh, Japan. Uh, we've seen this year uh, uh, Chinese Naval Air Force is actually flying together, circumnavigating Japan, and also uh, Chinese fighters escorting Russian bombers uh, in the Sea of Japan. So uh, this is another aspect of this uh, buildup that we need to consider. Uh, China is also showing the flag. They're using soft power. If you recall, in February, January, February this year, a volcano exploded in Tonga and you know, spewed ash all over Tonga. And it was a very devastating uh, natural disaster for the people of Tonga. Uh, and I won't go into what we did other than say we sent, I think, a destroyer a few days later. Uh, but what China did is they sent two large deck amphibs, a resupply ship and this large deck amphib. And they came and they dropped off all these pallets, all these tractors, uh, and they really provided a lot of support. And so, you know, Throughout my career in the Pacific, which was most of my career, we, the Pacific Fleet and the 7th Fleet, were known for being the guys that were the first on call. 
to get to a place when there was a hurricane or a typhoon or a natural disaster, an earthquake, uh, and help the people of whatever country it was in the, in the Pacific. Uh, and I'm worried about where we're at in terms of where China is uh, and where they're advancing. We could talk about the South Pacific and what they're doing in the Solomons or Kiribati, but this is just one physical example of where they're beating us to the punch in soft power. Lastly, uh, out in uh, Western and Central China, in this last eight to 10 months, China's dropped 350 ICBM silos. And uh, we need to consider, you know, for the last several years, the annual report from the DOD to Congress about the PLA has always said that China's warhead count, nuclear warheads, is around 200. Well, these 350 silos filled with a DF-41 ICBM that has at least 10 MIRVs, well, that all of a sudden goes from 200 to close to 4,000 nuclear warheads. And so how does that play into an invasion of Taiwan? This is the last line. So for about 10 years, I've been given this uh, talk and this slide. And the point is to say that China's on a timeline. And I think people, you know, have, for a long time, our China hands are quote unquote experts on China inside academics and our government have told us that China takes a long view and they're willing to kick the can down the road. But uh, I, I think China's on a timeline. They've told us they're on a timeline. Xi Jinping has articulated that he's on a timeline and he's articulated, he's mentioned it many different ways, but one of them is he says he wants to have the great uh, rejuvenation of China and the great restoration of China to be a world power by one October, 2049. He also, like his predecessor, Hu Jintao, and most likely Jiang Zemin, ordered the PLA to have the capability to take Taiwan starting as early as 2020. So we know that, I know for a fact, we know for a fact that those orders were given by Hu Jintao and, and, and uh, Xi Jinping. So like any good military, the PLA has been under orders from their boss uh, to, to be ready to have that capability. And I know that people will debate that. I know that there's been, you know, uh, conferences at CMSI, China Maritime Studies Institute at the War College, just recently this year, talking about that. Uh, but, you know, the fact is that was the order that was given to the PLA. So the question is, you know, how late can they use military force and still expect to have kind of this world celebration that China expects to have in 2049? I believe that China would like to acquire all this disputed territory. Uh, obviously, Taiwan is the number one thing that they want to take. And we've seen that reflection of that here just in this last couple of weeks. But they also have disputes with India. They have disputes with Japan over the Senkakus. And they even have disputes with Russia. But for the most part, they want to be territorially whole on 1 October 2049. But they would like to use what they, this comprehensive national power to get uh, get this territory without using force, like they were able to acquire Hong Kong and Macau without getting force. Um, so that's been the goal. That's been the strategy. But as this decade goes on, there's going to be growing voices for uh, the use of force. And I say the decade because I believe that uh, if you try to, you know, calculate when they would use force that the, at the last possible minute, it's somewhere around 2030. Uh, which is kind of the same difference in time uh, that went on between uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989 and the Beijing Olympics. That's about a 20-year period when the world watched uh, Chinese government kill their civilians by running tanks over them, and we were aghast at that. And then 20 years later, we were all beating the door down to attend the opening ceremonies of the Beijing Olympics. So if you back up 20 years from 2049, you get to about 2030. So this decade of concern between 2020, when the really they started to calculate how we're going to take with military force Taiwan to 2030 is this really dangerous and concerning time period. But uh, given everything that I've watched, I used to talk mostly about 2030. But what I'm seeing right now, the rhetoric, the actions, what they're doing, the training, this was a dress rehearsal that we saw 4 through 7 August. And... Also, what's happening domestically in the United States that factors into their calculus, what's happening domestically in Japan factors into their calculus, what's happening domestically in Taiwan politically factors into their calculus, and also the demographic change, challenges that China has. They have a problem with uh, an aging society. 
They have a problem with resources in terms of fuel to be able to you know, run their economy. Uh, they have problems with water. They have problems with food. So uh, they had a big you know, campaign last year to tell people to not eat so much and to clean their plates and not to take more from the buffet than they could eat. So there's a lot of concern in China about whether or not past 2030, they're going to have the resources and the wherewithal and the population to be able to achieve that uh, great uh, rejuvenation and restoration of territory. So I think we are in a really dangerous time right now. And as early as 2025, we could see something. Uh, and I think we need to be very cognizant of that and make our decisions based on the fact that, you know, we just saw something that's hasn't seen in, in 26 years of China firing missiles at Taiwan. And when they did that in 1996, uh, they got kind of embarrassed by the U.S. when we sent two carriers there and they had nothing to do uh, against it. They couldn't say a thing. They just had to go back and, you know, kind of put their tail between their legs and, 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 and eat that in humiliation, but not now. So that's uh, the end of my presentation and over to you all. Jim, that, that's a sobering presentation. It's exceptionally well done. We've got a lot of comments and questions in the uh, in the chat window. I want to get to a couple of those uh, to, to, to kind of kick off the conversation. Uh, one of the questions was from uh, Phineas Dagenbach. What are the strategic steps the U.S. can take to stop and reverse the continued rise in confidence of the Chinese military? How can we prevent China from achieving true competitor status with the U.S.? Yeah, well, that's, the, that's kind of the $64,000 question. What can we do to, to deter them from acting? And uh, I think right now, you know, we have to take a whole of government approach. And so I think uh, the previous administration was the first U.S. administration, regardless of party, uh, to really recognize that we had to, a strategic competitor and that we had to do something about it. And so I think uh, confronting China across all the domains of dip diplomacy, information, economic, you know, we, we, why is it that, you know, our major head funds, uh, hedge fund managers are investing trillions of dollars uh, in China? Why, why is that? Because we know that some percentage of that money goes to build up the PLA, the rocket forces, the naval forces, the air forces, all designed to kill uh, and be used to kill American service members, uh, why would we continue to do that? So if we started to choke off their money, that's going to get their attention and it's going to cause them to worry because if the economy goes down in China, now do they not only have to worry about not having money to fund the military, they have to worry about what do their people do if they're making stuff that nobody buys. And so they bet that we're Americans and we're Westerners uh, here in Europe and other places, that we will be more willing to knuckle under and say, well, we can't afford that. If you remember the tariffs during the, the previous administration, there was a lot of concern. Well, the farmers won't accept this. Uh, they ended up doing accepting it. They got some uh, reimbursement from the government. But the point is, if we're really serious about this question and getting to it, we're going to have to choke off the money. Then we're going to have to increase our presence I know there's a big debate going on in Washington over presence. I know guys like Bob Work and others are saying we can't be forward deployed. Uh, I'm a believer in forward deployment. I think we need to be there. If it was, if I was a king for a day, which I never will be, but if I was, I'd be thinking about sending the Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group through the Taiwan Strait. We haven't sent a Carrier Strike Group through the Taiwan Strait since 2007. That's uh, a long time, and when you don't use it, you lose it. That's why we do FAUNOPS. We do the Freedom of Navigation Operations, not because we're trying to say that we're going to military defeat uh, the Chinese, but what we're trying to build is an international consensus and coalition that says those excessive straight baseline claims are invalid and we're challenging them so that they can never come in. You know, if China were able to ever say that the United States didn't challenge one of those disputed territories in the South China Sea, they'd be the first ones to march into the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague and, and put it forward a case saying, hey, legally, these are ours. No one challenges them. Even though they said in 2016, then that case went to trial and, and, and concluded, they called it a farce. They'll turn around the very next day and say, oh, well, we want to use this court to validate our claims. That's called legal warfare, law, lawfare. And they will use the law to, to steal territory from people. And may not matter to some Americans in middle America, but it doesn't matter to us because $5 trillion worth of uh, goods and services go through the South China Sea. 
And America stands up for the values of small nations, not just big, powerful nations. So frequently you'll hear Chinese foreign ministry types talk about, well, we're a big country and you small countries need to do what we say. They're doing that right now with Lithuania. Jim, uh, I want to get to a couple more questions from the audience, uh, but I want to pose a question or just bring this uh, line of thinking up because when you and I worked together in the Pacific, you were at Pacific Fleet and I was working in the China division at the PACOM Joint Intelligence Operations Center. And there was a lot, we were, we were focusing, our teams were focusing very much on the capabilities that the Chinese were building, what we now term A2AD, anti-access area denial capabilities, which were the capabilities to keep the US and, and other outside parties, Japan, Australia, et cetera, from coming to the rescue of Taiwan. And then they also had capabilities specifically designed to take down the Taiwan military itself, right? Uh, so back to that previous question about what can the US do in terms of military capabilities, in terms of you know looking at Chinese strengths and weaknesses and our strengths and weaknesses, what are the things that the US ought to be focused on in terms of our military investment now to, to, to limit to the extent that we can China's advantages and, and also to, to wreak havoc with their, with their greatest weaknesses, if you will. Yeah, that great question, Bill. Number one in my book is, as us being Navy types is, we have to get back to saying we're, we are a Navy that's designed purposefully and solely right now to sink other navies and specifically the Chinese Navy. And so what you have in the PLA Navy is a programmatic 20 year programmatic effort to put anti-ship cruise missiles uh, on all their platforms, all their major surface combatants, their aircraft, their submarines uh, and from shore based. And it's a, a very capable uh, program. And they really, you know, it's canisterized, it's, it's interchangeable amongst different platforms. And we haven't done that. We have approached a piecemeal approach. It was in special, you know, compartmented stuff years ago, and it's just never really gelled into a, a kind of a, a number one Navy priority. Even though we've had Pacific Fleet commanders, I know for 15 years, that said it was their number one concern, having just these short range subsonic harpoon missiles. And then those are almost going to get phased out. And there was a big hue and cry about that. So we need to get back to the idea that you know, when you and I joined the Navy, we were facing the Soviet Navy, and that's what we thought about. That's what we planned to. How do we sink the Soviet Navy? And we need to have a Navy that says, how do we sink the Chinese Navy? And unfortunately, what's happened over the last 30 years of fighting in the desert is that we've got a, now a Navy that says, well, we have to be able to do everything. And because of that, we're unable to do anything when it comes to dealing with the PLA Navy. So we have to have the capability, top to bottom, to be able to destroy and sink the PLA Navy, because without the PLA Navy, they're never going to be able to fully take Taiwan. They may be able to bomb a lot of it uh, with their ballistic missiles, but they won't be able to get the boots on the ground in sufficient numbers to be able to uh, take that territory. And then if they did take that territory, we, you know, we could have a discussion about what are the implications of Taiwan falling into the PRC's hands. We can just say for an agreement's sake right now, it's a long argument, but it's, it's not good for America's national security. And it's certainly not good for Taiwan or Japan or Korea or Australia or anybody else. It's a friend of ours. So we don't want that to happen. So if we don't want that to happen, we have to be able to destroy the PLA Navy, PLA Navy Air Forces, other air forces that come out. We have to be able to put them down. Uh, we can even talk about striking the mainland. But from my perspective, what's the number one thing is we need to get all hands on deck saying that sinking the Chinese Navy is the sole purpose of the U.S. Navy today. And I know that will, people from the Mideast group will get upset about that. But until we can put that down and say, you guys, you got everything for 30 years, that's done now. We are getting on with the main task of defending America. And we have to be able to put the PLA Navy down in Davy Jones's locker. If we can't do that, we may not have a Navy in, in, in 50 years. Great points. Yeah. And uh uh, a little bit of a spoiler alert for the coming September issue of Proceedings, which is naval aviation focused. We've got an article by a naval aviator who says, stop sending carriers to CENTCOM. That's the title of it. Um, basically saying, hey, look, you know, we've got the, the, the we got our hands full we, in the Pacific with China. 
And, uh, you know, we've got other forces that can manage the, the smaller problem in the Middle East. But for China, we've got to keep our carriers and we've got to keep our, our um, you know, our most capable platforms in the Pacific and focused on the China problem. Uh, Austere Roberto, one of our frequent uh, listeners and, and commentators, uh, he, he brought up two things. First is uh, he, he touched on your demographic timeline. You mentioned that, uh, you know, there's a lot more 80 year olds than 20 year olds in China in 2035. And then he also had a comment earlier about uh, about, the, you know, as the Chinese economy slows down, how will that impact? I, I think that both those factors, in my view, play into your your period of concern right now, but your, your thoughts on those, those two things. Right. I think, you know, uh, demographics are something that we, we don't talk about a lot. I think we talk about them more today than we did ever. Um, but uh, the idea that China is going to be an aging society and, you know, Japan's an aging society. A lot of different places in Europe are aging societies, but they're also wealthy societies. And so what China has been trying to do is to make China a wealthy society before it becomes an aging society. And there's a big debate in academic circles about whether or not China will become an aging society first and then try to continue to still make it a wealthy society. And maybe the, the jury's still out on that. But that's why it's important for us to have a credible military deterrent, because if we can delay their decision making process, they use uh, you, you, you. We talked about comprehensive national power. They also use a thing called scientific development inside CNP, which is they Rubik's Cube everything. They, they war game everything. They, they're always constantly in analyzing. You know, there's like 98 million party members, and they're always looking at, well, if I do something in the economic arena, what will this do in the information or legal arena or in the military arena or vice versa? And they'll calculate all that out. And I think one of the things they haven't really calculated is because we had basically a 50-year po policy of, you know, uh, engagement with China, you know, uh, former Secretary of State Pompeo called it blind engagement. Before I heard him ever use that, I was using the phrase, we had unconstrained and unaccountable engagement with China. And so China knew that for, for whatever reason, the United States was more interested in engaging than in confronting them. Well, if we were to come in and start to really do things that showed them that we we're confronting them, they're going to have to go back to their drawing board and recalculate, well, what happens if things don't happen the way we think it is? Are we prepared? And so we need as much doubt and most uh, and much uh, confusion that we can introduce into the thought process. We should do that. So focusing on the aging society, writing articles about it, telling them, hey, you're going to be too old to do this. Your, your young people aren't going to want to risk their lives. Their one child system, even though they've opened it up now, it's not changing. Basically, people are still having one child, maybe two in some some areas, but it's largely one child. They're a one child government now. Most of the people in, in government you know, maybe not at the very top, but the, the rank and file, they're all coming from one party uh, uh, backgrounds and, and experiences. And so if we can feed into that and play a little information warfare on their minds, maybe they'll reconsider. That's all part of it. It's not just any one thing. Uh, and then obviously uh, there was age and what was the other? Uh, oh, just uh, their economy as their economy. Yeah, the economy. Is Yep. Yeah, in their economy, I just read something today that says the Chinese economy is is contracting and it's also in a recession. So this is another area why why would we pump them up with our own money from our own markets uh, in our investment funds into China when they're struggling to, to try to get dollars? Let's let's not feed them. Let's let's try to make their economy go south and then see how the party uh, survives because. You know, we're told by the experts, and I believe it, that, you know, the, the number one goal of the Chinese Communist Party is to stay in power. And they've been able to stay in power for, for you know, quite a long time now because they've been able to come through and say, I've made your life better. You know, if you go to China, you know, maybe pre-COVID, but if you went to China anywhere between 2000 and 2015, China's a pretty modern place in many areas. They still had a lot of poverty in many other areas, but in the big cities, Beijing, Shanghai, you know, these other other places, they had they had modernity and they were starting to make a change to that. And uh, if that goes south and those people that had apartments, had cars, had, you know, whatever it is that they liked, if that starts going away. They're not going to be happy and they're going to take it out on somebody. At least that's the hope. Now, we've you know, I, I'm not saying regime change. I'm just saying put the pressure on and make the party have to earn their pay. Yeah, great point. Uh, we've got a question from GKD. 
how is the U.S. Navy supposed to match the shipbuilding and modernization rate of the PLA Navy with a commercial slash military shipbuilding industry that has significantly shrunk since the end of World War II? Yeah, that's that's the question for this this naval shipbuilding. And it, it, it's just a painful to read those words on the screen because it just, from my perspective, you and I talked, I mean, we some of us have been trying to warn about this for a long time. And navies are not something you can just flip a light switch and say, oh, okay, tomorrow we'll have, you know, 15 carriers. It's just not going to happen. And so we have to be Americans. We have to be innovative and creative. And so we're going to have to go back and, and say, well, what about ships and mothballs? You know, we had a, a you know, the U.S. Navy, lo love the institution, it's my home, but we have people that said, well, we're never going to go back to the mothball fleet. We're not going to do that. It's too much. It costs too much. Not enough people. And there's a lot of truth to all those things. But if we're going to get in a dogfight with the Chinese Navy, then we're we're going to have to do something different. And we're, we're, we just can't throw up our hands and say, you know, Bohica, it's over and, and that's it. We can't do that. So we're going to have to come up with new innovative ways to put platforms at sea that have weapons that can sink their fleet. And uh, there's a lot of recommendations that are coming forward. Guys like Jerry Hendricks, who I've mentioned before, he's got a lot of great ideas. Right, Sadler, there's a lot of people that are putting forward ideas. But all those little niches aside, you know, again, king for a day, first thing I do is I'd announce a nationwide Navy shipbuilding uh, restoration program. Uh, we need somebody like a, a, a John Stennis. We need somebody that's going to come in and tell the American people, bipartisan, get out of partisanship, that get into national defense and say it's in our national defense to be able to have the capacity to build a fleet. And we need to do it now and we need to prioritize that. Uh, but when I watch the news every day, I see a lot of other priorities being listed. Great point. Um, Jim, we are uh, about out of time here, and I think we could go on for quite a, quite a while. Lots of people asking questions, but this is going to be a foundational uh, episode of the podcast that I know, uh, based on the reaction to your presentation in Cambridge, there were so many folks who came up afterwards and said, I did not know that about the Chinese Navy. And a lot of them were young U.S. Navy, Naval Academy midshipmen. Uh, a few of them were recent graduates from the from the Naval Academy, et cetera. Uh, a lot of uh, you know young folks uh, uh, from our you know allied partners in Europe and uh, England, of course. So the the reaction was was so strong, and I'm sure that this is going to be an episode that's going to get many many views. And we'll have to get you on you know maybe again next year to update it for us. But it's been great having you on the show. Thanks for doing what you're doing. Thanks for writing for proceedings over and over on this topic. Uh, for those who maybe haven't seen it, Jim wrote in the May issue of proceedings an update on the PLA Navy this year. He did it the previous year. Yeah, so this year is called the PLA Navy Growth Not Slowed by COVID. It's just a terrific article. Um, but Jim, thanks for everything you're doing for us. Thank you, Bill. I really appreciate it. And uh, all the best to everybody uh, that watches this. And uh, yeah, go Navy. Okay. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast. Our producer is Heather Legg. Raytheon is our sponsor this month. Raytheon Missiles and Defense is setting the pace of performance with the SPY-6 family of radars actively being integrated across the fleet. SPY-6 provides the clearest possible picture of the battle space with modular multi-mission capabilities that make it the most advanced radar on earth. Learn, learn more at rtx.com forward slash SPY-6. Until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. Out here.